This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you are in the future because you're listening to Christina Gomez and Shifting the Paradigm. Howdy, folks. This is Lou Elizondo, and you are listening to my very good friend, Christina Gomez, on Shifting the Paradigm. This is Ray Sobs from the Unex Network, and you're listening to Shifting the Paradigm with the intrepid Christina Gomez on the X. You're listening to the Unex Network, KUNX DV, Kansas City, Missouri. Welcome to Shifting the Paradigm. I'm Christina Gomez on the Paradigm Shifts channel and on the X, the new mainstream KUNX digital broadcasting talk radio. Are you ready for this? Because we are about to embark on an hour and a half of UFO shenanigans and paranormal adventures. Right here is where we look and think outside the proverbial box. We jump down those rabbit holes where you get a red Tic Tac instead of a red pill. First off, make sure you subscribe and share these shows on social media to those who you think are having their minds and eyes open to the reality of the UFO mystery. All of these shows are great primers. And in the push for more clarity, transparency, and disclosure, the more voices demanding answers, the better. For those listening on KUNX Talk Radio and Affiliates, I have two other shows each week that only air on my YouTube channel. Mysteries with the History will be on Wednesday at 2 p.m. PST this week with my co-host Jimmy Church of Fade to Black Radio on KUNX. And each week we cover a different topic in depth. On Fridays at 3 p.m. PST, the show Strange Paradigms is where I and a different guest co-host cover all the strange weekly news and mysterious headlines from around the world. So definitely check out my website at strangeparadigms.com for all show archives, more information, and direct video links to my channel. Also, make sure to hit the notification bell on YouTube. I've been getting comments by viewers that when they click the bell, they are not getting notifications. And then when they return to my channel, they realize that the bell has been turned off. Some have even stated they have unsubscribed without their knowledge. So please make sure that you are subscribed and getting notifications. With the intro out of the way, let me talk about my guest. Cheryl Costa is a two-service military veteran of the United States Air Force and United States Navy, along with being a retired professional from the aerospace industry. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from the State University of New York at Empire State College in entertainment writing and production. With years of dedication to the UFO field, she was awarded Researcher of the Year in 2018 by the International UFO Congress. Welcome to Shifting the Paradigm, Cheryl. How's it going? Very good, very good. Thanks for having me, Christine. Uh, Thank you for being here. Before we get started, while you are well-established in the UFO community, for my younger audience, high school leavers and college-age students, what would you like them to know about yourself and your work? Uh, The real short bio. Um, Two, mil- two years military service with the Air Force, served in Vietnam in combat, uh, served in the Cold War Navy and nuclear submarines, did a lot of Tom Clancy stuff, you see. And if you're questioning 
my voice, my deep voice and everything. Yes, I'm a trans woman. Um, thir- uh, post, post transition by 33 years. In fact, I'm one of the six people who coined the term transgender. Now, so now I've, I've, I've spilled everything. Um, the UFO stuff, I, I was pretty red th- through most of my adult life uh, from actually from about 12, 15 years old through junior high school back in the 60s, all the way up to um, uh, around 2012. And I was retired out of my job at Lockheed Martin, 32 years with Lockheed Martin and uh, in 2011. And I got this idea to... I was finishing a, a degree in entertainment writing. Uh, it was a long overdue degree, and I had done most of the work. It was just a matter of, of, of doing it, of uh, getting the degree, so to speak. So I uh, went around to about six or seven newspaper editors in upstate New York and pitched the idea of how about a weekly column for about UFOs and talk straight up about it. And uh, they laughed me out of the office, chased me out of the office, had security escort me to the door out of the office, that type of thing. Finally, one editor invited me, said, come on over, let's have a cup of tea. Came over, we talked, we were about the same age. He had read a lot of the same books I had read in the 60s and 70s. So, well, he said, I'll try you out for a month. And he had this tone of the dread pirate Roberts on Princess, uh, the Princess Bride. And uh, the bottom line was, Called me back about a month later. I'd given him five articles and he said, get over here. We need to talk. And I thought, oh, well, that's it. You know, it's over with. I'm late coming into the meeting. I come into the meeting. All the all the columnists are sitting behind this big table and he stops talking what he's saying. And he looks over and says, there's our rock star. And I looked at him and said, what are you talking about? He says, you've been here five weeks and you're pulling more page views on the web edition than all of our columnists combined. Keep doing it. Okay. And that's, uh, that's what I do now about, let's see, it was 2013. We did the column all the way up to 2019, but around 2015, my wife and I, uh, my wife, Linda Miller Costa, uh, and I were looking at the data and we did some unique crunching of the data using MUFON, Mutual UFO Network and National UFO Reporting Center, New Fork data about New York state, which was the, my beat. Uh, I wrote about New York uh, New York State. It was called New York Skies was the name of the column. And um, we realized we had found a lot of cool stuff. And we started showing all this stuff to some retired MUFON investigators, MUFON uh, state directors, this type of thing. And they're going, we didn't know there was a cluster there. We didn't know there was a cluster there either. And it was only because we manipulated the data differently than other people. Linda was the brains behind that operation. She She came from having worked for 15 years as a head librarian at the Environmental Protection Agency. So she was big on doing research, forensic data. She said, what would happen if we did, we were in our pub, and she said, what would happen if we did the whole country? And I looked at her for 10 minutes going, oh my goodness, it might take us a year. It took us 18 months, 18 months worth of weekends. We both were still doing, you know, day jobs kind of thing. And the book kind of blew everybody's socks off when it came out. It was called the UFO Sightings Desk Reference, United States of America, 2001 to 2015. And um, the New York Times, we came out with it in March of 2017. The New York Times did a huge science magazine article, which is a huge deal because usually mainstream papers did not do anything nice about UFOs. If they wrote an article, usually it was like, ha ha, wink, wink, you know, that kind of thing. And they did an article. If you want to Google it, Google NYT for New York Times, UFO Costa, C-O-S-T-A, NYT space UFO space Costa. And you'll get an April 24th web article uh, about us writing this book of data statistics, charts, graphs, numbers. Now, a lot of people criticize this. They said, oh, Cheryl, why did you do that? It's just charts, graphs, and numbers. Oh, my God, it's boring. Where's your case studies? The book is one big case study. We don't go down to the individual sighting. We go down to the, at that time, it was like 121,000. Our current book that came out in 2021, 2001 to 2020, 20-year sample, 167,632 UFO sightings 
reported between the two databases over 20 years. And that's what our current data is. And we can tell you where they are, where they're not. Uh, we can tell you their seasons. You know, the shapes have seasons. You know, the shapes of UFOs have seasons. Um, and recently, just three weeks ago, we, we figured out how to look at 50 states over 20 years, day by day. That's 146,060 days, 7,303 days per year for 20 years, including leap years. Okay. And we times 50 states and it comes up to this 146,060 days. And we identified in there one, I'm sorry, 737 one day hotspots. These are the places you've never heard of. Nothing much goes on there most of the time. And one day they had this spike of activity, as, as many as four, as much as maybe 20, 25 in one day. And uh, we just, we knew they were out there. We just didn't know how to find them. And we finally figured out a way to uh, crunch the data in such a way we could identify these 737 hotspots. There's a lot of things that you touched on that I do want to get to a little bit later, but let's let's backtrack a little bit. Let's talk about New York. This is your home state. What UFO cases have you looked into when it comes to New York? Okay. Linda and I don't okay, as a as a journalist, I looked at a lot of New York State cases. Okay. Uh, I wrote stories about them. In fact, one of the cool things we did with this column was we didn't sensationalize the UFO sighting. We wrote about it like the fire down the street, the the the, car, the carjacking across town, uh, that type of thing. We wrote it just another news story, a matter of very matter of fact. Um, there was a lot of different ones. Uh, I had two ladies came back from the lake one day, two elder ladies, um, married couple, and uh, they came back from the lake and they went to, uh, they had just gotten back in, uh, had the car in the driveway. One of them was bringing in their bags from outside, from the from the trip, you know, they'd been up at the cottage or something. And the other one had gone into the stairwell to go down to their pantry to get some canned stuff to make supper. And she got in the, into the, in the stairwell and she let off a blood curdling scream. The other lady dropped the bag, come running in. And there's the other lady on kind of like a landing in this like mode like this. And when she looked over the woman, she saw what appeared to be bats, you know, kind of, you know, this type of thing, all right, okay. But so she literally dragged the other lady out of the well and closed the door thinking, oh my gosh, we got bats in the cellar, okay. And later they went down the cellar to see if bats had come down like the chimney. Okay, and there was no bat droppings, no, no, no guano, nothing like this. Nothing. There was no evidence that there were any bats down there. Okay, and they were scratching their head. Over the next few days, the lady who dragged the other lady out of the stairwell started saying, "You know, they really didn't look like bats." There were these like amorphous little forms that kind of looked like bats kind of thing, okay? And the more their heads began to clear, then the first woman remembered when she stepped into the cellar stairwell and looked down to the bottom of the stairs, there was a little man about three feet high, bald, rather large almond eyes and a, some kind of a blue jumpsuit kind of thing. And suddenly she's seeing all these bats. Now, there's a lot of theory out there about the fact that when people run into certain types of ETs, particularly the grays, um, they telepathically reach into your subconscious and touch your archetypes, okay? We all have archetypes in our brains. And one of those archetypes are birds. So a lot of people who have been abducted remember a bird, okay? and uh, or some other archetype, like a bat or something like this, okay? And uh, that's what this appeared to be. And I interviewed those ladies, oh, about five, uh, let's see, uh, I would say about 2016 timeframe, okay? 
um, a cool sighting case. Um, I'll give you one of mine. Um, well, my first sightings were like when I was like 12 years old and 18 years old. First one was in upstate New York with my parents, late August afternoon, uh, a couple weeks before school got back into session. This is about 1965. And we were coming down off a hill visiting my uncle uh, up in uh, up near Bath, New York. And we were, uh, it was a wet season. The, grant, the, the, the corn was higher than our car. And we were coming down this dirt road. My mother had my father stop. And she pointed out into the western sky, four o'clock in the afternoon, clear blue sky, not a cloud in the sky. And parked out there like a rock was a, a silver ball parked there. And to give you an idea how big it is, hold your arm out and look at your little finger now. That's just about how big it was as far as perspective to us. So we talked about it for a few minutes and I didn't know what it was. My mother, NASA, was only five or six years old in those days, 1965. I was 12. And uh, my mom said it might be a weather balloon. It might be something the Air Force is doing. It might be something NASA is doing. And then she dropped the big one on me. She says, you know, it might be people from another world. And she was dead serious. We talked about that for a couple of minutes. My father started the car up. We went down the bottom of the hill, turned left to head back to our hometown. Okay, I got up in the back window of the Chevy Impala. Those big old Impalas had these really big rear windows, right? And I got up there in the window and said, who are you guys? Who are you guys? And about 10 minutes later, when they decided to leave, I didn't see an effect like that until like the late 80s, early 90s, in one of the Star Trek movies. This thing went boom in this bright flash of light kind of thing. It must have went into warp or something, you know? And I didn't see an effect like that, like I said, until I was in the movies like 30 years, 40 years later, you know? So um, that was an amazing thing. Um, I was in camera on Bay Vietnam uh, uh, in 1971. Uh, this was Christmas Eve, 1971. Um, Cameron Bay is about middle part of South Vietnam, about middle way down the country. Um, this little sandbar sticks out there, kind of like for, for Virginia Beach. The rest of the place is a jungle out on this particular big area um, at Cameron Bay. It was a large sandbar. Okay, They even issued us a different kind of boot because you had to walk on sand and regular jungle boots did not walk on sand very well. Uh, so we got, gen we got desert gear, so to speak. Um, so we were out, this friend of mine and I were walking down to uh, go to Midnight Mass, Christmas Eve, okay? Uh, neither one of us were practicing Catholics at that point, but um, eh, tradition, let's go down to Midnight Mass. And we did. And as we were walking down, we saw this thing streak going across the sky. And, you know, we're in Vietnam, we said, ah, jet, and it stops. And my friend looked at me and says, uh, Jets don't stop. And I said, yeah, and helicopters don't fly that fast. And we sat there and looked at it. I said, what the heck is that? And I said, you know, I'm pretty well read on UFOs. If that's what I think it is, it might start dancing around like a fairy. Darn if it didn't. <laughs> Gone. Neither one of us had our minds on midnight mass. Okay. Now, a good story from 2013, I think, I'd like to wrap up the story cases here. Um, 2013. It happened in February of 2013, up near Troy, New York, okay, uh, near the Albany area, uh, very high in Hudson Valley area. And um, these people were driving on this industrial uh, access road near a, an industrial park, okay? And they saw uh, a couple of people described it as seeing these three lights coming in from different directions over top of this industrial park. And uh, the three lights came together and formed one big blue light. And it came down close to the ground. Um, people's cars that were on the access road near where this thing was hovering, uh, their engines quit, their cell phones quit, all that stuff, okay? And then what happened was, some of the people said that they uh, told me that they, it was like a, you know, a normal house is about an eight foot ceiling. You go into a Victorian era house, it's like a 12 foot ceiling. It was like, it was like that close. You could almost reach up and touch it, they said. Okay, a couple of people walked under it. And then when it decided to leave, it went up, it 
split apart from being three uh, one one ball of blue light into three blue uh, three white lights and each went off in a different direction okay what there was one report that said one of the ones going south hit kind of like a red trail after it type of thing and i tried for better part of 10 months to see if i can get a major paper i was at a little weekly paper i tried to get a major paper to report the story i had tons of information i had interviewed people nobody would touch it so the last story I wrote in 2013 was this particular case. And I had the case number from MUFON, all that kind of thing. And I, I wrote the story up myself and published it myself. That's so exciting. And those stories are incredibly bizarre. Talking about the little gray being and, and depicting bats, I find very interesting. And I didn't put those two pieces together where other people do see types of bird-like creatures or bats, and uh, it, it's consistent. Now, going back to your sighting when you were 12, is that how your interest got started in all of this? Or was it something else that made you take a, a deep dive into being oh. so fascinated in it like you are today? Okay. Let's think in terms of when we were teenagers, okay? teenage, I was 12, just going on 13. And, you know, at that age, mom and dad are stupid. They don't get it. You know, that kind of thing, you know. And um, so uh, I was up in the back of that car and I saw that thing, you know, and it changes you. You see a thing like that. It, your reality is just not the same ever again. In fact, anybody who sees something, once they've tried to rationalize a UFO sighting, and it's beyond anything that they can describe. It kind of expands your view of reality a little bit. Okay. So in my case, I started getting books at, at, at the library at school. My mom got books from the library in town. We would share things. We would have conversations. I'm disowned and disinherited. Okay, here I am. I'm a trans person. That didn't rub my family well. And oh, by the way, I'm a card carrying witch, you know, a wicked witch. Okay, fine. That didn't. So I'm disowned and disinherited. But if I were to call my mother up and say, I got a really good UFO sighting, she would sit there and listen to me and she would talk to me about it. That's about the only thing we can talk about, but she would. But okay, back in high school, I read everything I'd get my hands on. She read all the school stuff. When, uh, uh, Eric Von Daniken's book, um, Chariot of the Gods, came out there in the late 60s. We got a paperback copy. She dog-eared on the top of the book, uh, the book pages. I dog-eared on the bottom. We about destroyed that book. Okay, um, So I was well-read on the topic. I wasn't a fanatic about it. Uh, it was in 1969, a year before I graduated high school, that we got this little mimeograph letter in the mail from someplace in Illinois. That they were forming this organization called the Mutual UFO Network. Okay. And this is a year after the Project Blue Book turned it all off, said the Air Force doesn't need to be in it. Oh, there's nothing to see here, folks. These aren't the droids you want, that type of thing. And um, so uh, that was it. And when I got into the Air Force, they told us if we hung out with people like the UFO community or anything like that, and there's 700 organizations you can't be a member of and keep your security clearance. So I kept as far away from it as I could. All through my military career of uh, probably total nine years between the Air Force and the Navy, okay, I kept away from the topic matter. I might read stuff on it, but I never really made myself visible about it. Same thing when I went to work for uh, military product, uh, IBM military products or federal systems that later became a, a, a division of Lockheed Martin. Okay. Um, again, I get 32 years in a high defense industry type of clearance. I did not, uh, I did not uh, really affiliate. As soon as I was retired out, then I began actively trying to plug in uh, and my way of doing it was going out and pitching the idea of let me do a newspaper column. Oh my gosh, Cheryl, I have so many more questions for you, but we're coming towards a break. So hang tight. We'll be right back.
million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse. KUNX DB. BX. This is Micah Hanks of the Micah Hanks program right here on KUNX. And right now, you're having your paradigm shifted by the one and only Christina Gomez. For alternative talk radio on the internet, the X. Howdy, folks. This is Lou Elizondo, and you are listening to my very good friend Christina Gomez on Shifting the Paradigm. Do you have an interest in the paranormal? Then you'll love the unxnetwork.com. The X is your streaming audio and video for everything supernatural, strange, and mysterious, like UFOs, Bigfoot, ghosts, and so much more. From hosts like Jimmy Church, Whitley Strieber, Micah Hanks, and Christina Gomez, visit the unxnetwork.com show page for a complete list of all the paranormal programs you'll find on the X. Be sure to follow us on Twitter for updates at KUNXDB. Follow our Facebook group, UNX Network. Find the podcast on Spotify, iHeart, Audible, and Apple Podcast. It's time. It's new. It's the X. X. So you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on 24-7 with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Explaining the unexplained. The new unxnetwork.com. Hi, hi. This is Race Hobbs, head of programming at the new Unex Network, and you're locked on Shifting the, the paradigm, paradigm with the intrepid Christina, Christina Gomez, Gomez on, on the X. The X. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you are in the future because you're listening to Christina Gomez and Shifting the Paradigm. Welcome back. With me today is Cheryl Costa. And like I said right before the break, I have so many more questions. You touched on so many things. I don't know where to start, but let's kind of start with still on the basics, getting to know you. 
You were a part of the Air Force, Navy, Aerospace, and Lockheed Martin.、Uh, can I ask you what you did in each of those branches and things? Okay, in the Air Force, I climbed telephone poles. Now, I had I, I was second in my class in high school electronics class, but you, did you think the Air Force would put me into like radio or ra- radar maintenance or something like that? You know,、uh, no, they didn't. Um, they assigned me to a telephone squadron, and I learned to climb telephone poles and fix telephone lines. Okay, and when I went to Vietnam, people shoot at you on telephone poles. You know, so <laughs> that was a little bit of a rude awakening.、Um, that's what I did in the Air Force, and I only served two years because my hometown got wiped out in a flood、uh, in 19 June of 1972. It was the Agnes Hurricane. They came up the East Coast, and they had already had a pretty wet season. And、uh, I was in uh, uh, working in Korea. By this point, I was out of Vietnam. I was in Korea. I volunteered for a second overseas assignment, and I went to work for an Air Force uh, telephone squ- uh, telephone、um, construction squadron. And we were building、uh, uh, an improvement to the telephone system、uh, in South Korea for the military. And、uh, I rolled over in the hotel I was staying in downtown, and Uh, we we got to live on the economy instead of living on base, and、uh, I turned on Armed Forces Radio and I caught the tail end of a five minute at the top of the hour newscast. And Governor Rockefeller has sent troops into the cities of Corning and Elmira to prevent looting. I'm going, huh? You know, and I'm from Corning, New York. You know, so、um, uh, so I got out for two years and、uh, helped my parents rebuild their home. And、uh, then I went back.、Uh, I tried to get back in the Air Force, and、uh, they had too many people. It was at the end of Vietnam War. They had more people, and they knew what to do with. They were redoing, doing what they call a RIF, a reduction in force. They were just get letting anybody out that wanted to get out. So I couldn't get back in. And I was coming out of the recruiting office, and the Navy recruiter came over to me and said, "Hey, kid, come here a minute. If I got a deal for you, you know." And、uh, he offered me a two-year package of school in the Navy, of、uh, high advanced electronics. So I signed up, went, went back in the,、uh, in the Navy, and spent two years in school,、uh, trained in radar, trained in periscope photography,、uh, trained in signals analysis, and I can't get into that much deeper than that. And then、uh, I, when I finally got on board a, a nuclear submarine, okay,、um, I was a radar operator. I was、uh, a signals analyst. I, at sea when we were underwater, I was a navigation watch. My collateral duties was I was the ship's tailor, and I was the ship's librarian, and I was also tra- tra- trained to,、uh, informally to be I was a half a dozen or so trained to be、um, uh, support like almost like an EMT. Because we had、uh, we had a doc on board, but he said if there's a contaminated space, I'm not going into it. You are. So he trained a bunch of us to you know go back there and do the vitals and triage and、uh, blood pressure, patch people up, things like this, learn to decontaminate them, that type of thing. So y- you wear a lot of hats if you're on a small crew of a submarine. Okay, and that's what I did. I had my normal training to do all this stuff, all the electronics and intelligence gathering and all this kind of stuff, and then my Like I said, my collateral duties was all this other stuff. I was, like I said, I was a ship's tailor,、uh, ship's librarian, and I did some of this other support stuff with the、um, uh, uh, dock on our ship. And you worked、uh, for Lockheed Martin for 32 years. Can you tell us about the company and why people in the UFO community are so interested in it? Well, I don't know about. Lockheed Martin and UFOs, but Lockheed Martin was a very good company to work for. Actually, the first fourteen years of the thirty-two years, it was uh, uh, IBM、uh, Federal Systems or IBM Military Products, that type of thing. And then、uh, one day we got bought. In fact, it was、uh, Feb- February of nineteen ninety-six, and、uh, we were in the middle of a forty-inch snowstorm in DC that that week. But、uh, we got back to work, uh, and uh, our team lead came into the office and said, "Hey, we were bought by Lockheed Martin over the weekend." Oh, okay, great, yay, you know. And it was about as far as it went. But Lockheed ended up being a very good opportunity、um, because it was a bigger company. It opened up a lot of career opportunities that the smaller division that we were in,、uh, Federal Systems, didn't offer. So.、Um, 
I was uh, electro. I was a um, computer virus specialist, and it was very limited in that IBM division. But when he got into uh, to Lockheed, um, I, I hate to say it this way, they didn't know how to spell antivirus, let alone administer it. So the handful of us that came into the company from this acquisition at the end of the Cold War uh, was uh, wow. There's people who know what they're talking about, about antivirus. <laughs> so I got to be in I, computer security and I did that kind of thing of uh, doing everything from chasing viruses off people's systems to, uh, uh, what's the term I want to use? Oh, uh, being a red hat, going in and finding out where the hackers could get in, that type of thing. I was really good at that. And then uh, I got to be an investigator. I got to be a, a, a proverbial internal cyber cop. Uh, Computer laptop comes up missing. Hey, uh, I, I did I did investigations that type of thing. And the goofy thing about that was, I was an ordained Buddhist nun at the time, so I had the bus cut and I dressed like the Dalai Lama every day at Lockheed Martin. You now look at the statistics of UFO sightings seen in the United States. How did you get into that? How many times have you taken a test and the math teacher said, "I don't care what the answer is. I want you to show me the work." Okay. And uh, that was the big problem. I, I just was able to intuit the answers. Okay. And then uh, when I got in the service, first thing they told me, and I'm, I understand high school, I was the lower quarter of my high school class, got in the service, in the Air Force, and they said, why aren't you a member of Mensa? I said, what are you talking about? He said, you've got 140 IQ. I'm going, what? You know, my, my, Guidance counselors in high school were calling me a dunce, for God's sakes. Well, it turned out I was dyslexic, and I didn't know it. And back in the 60s, they didn't test for that thing at the local school level. The other thing was um, uh, I found out that uh, this processing my math out here in another universe, that's called being a visual mathematician, and Einstein was one of them. I'm not an Einstein, but okay. Uh, that interview you probably read about. Um, after our book came out in 2017, okay, the UFO settings desk reference 2001 to 2015. Okay, we published a book of statistics. I must have got 20 or 30 phone calls from people I hadn't heard from in 30 or 40 years from my high school class. I said, Cheryl, you flunked math all the all through high school. Oh my God, you published a book of statistics. We've got six dead math teachers rolling over in their grave like a rotisserie, you know. So it was it was kind of a goofy thing. What happened to me in my mid twenties? One day I was bouncing my checkbook with my calculator, and I saw a pattern of numbers. And next thing you know, I'm playing with the pa the pattern of numbers, and these suddenly just all this all these numbers started singing to me. It was about twenty eight when this happened. It's called maturation. You can look it up. It's a known phenomena. You develop. It's like when when, when does some kids learn to speak at you know two some don't speak until they're three that type of thing okay it's when you mature into that skill and I didn't mature into a skill of mathematics until I was in my mid-20s okay um, these days people look at me and I, I hold all these numbers in my head you know these statistical numbers and just blows people's socks off especially people who I went to school with and said you weren't a math head in those days, baby, you know? So yeah, that's, that's how it worked out for me. Um, there was another thing I didn't mature as a writer until I was like 36 years old. Well, I was in the middle of my gender change and the joke we have in this household is maybe it was the girl hormones, all the girl juice I was taking, you know, and, uh, <laughs> who knows other weird things have happened like that. And, um, suddenly one night I was sitting there with a, old IBM, uh, it was called a portable. It looked like a sewing machine. It was heavier than you can get out. And uh, I sat there and I got on the word processor and just prose started pouring out of me, okay? Uh, being a writer was not my plan in life. It really wasn't. When you were a child or when you were in your teens, what did you imagine yourself to do when you were 20, 30 years old then? In my teens? I wanted to be Alfred Hitchcock. I wanted to be the next um, creepy filmmaker. And I made, a, I made a lot of short silent films in high school, okay? Um, and then uh, I went directly into the Air Force coming out of, the, coming out of high school. 
and um, I didn't get to work on films for a while. And then uh, in this, uh, let's see, in the early 80s, uh, well, I did some work in this in this in the 70s as I got access to, to you know 16 millimeter cameras, things like that. And then um, in the early 80s, um, I, I after I got out of the Navy, I, I went to film school. I went to State University of New York at Binghamton, and I was in their film program. And I was working for IBM at the time. And uh, somebody got a got a, a bug into some vice president's here, and he called me in one day for coffee. And he said, "You're in film school." I said, "Yeah." He says, "Could you make training films?" And I said, "You mean like training videos?" He said, "Yeah." And I said, "You got the money? Yeah, we can we can do anything you want. I know how to do it." So next thing you know, I spent the next five years making industrial training films. Okay. And uh, when I burned out from doing that, which is easy to do, uh, when I burned out, uh, I didn't look through a camera viewfinder. I didn't care if it was a box camera or what it was for almost two years. I, I just didn't want to touch a camera. And then it came back. And then in the early 90s, I started making, I uh, started producing television. Um, I still worked at IBM Federal Systems, but I, I was producing um, a predecessor to like YouTube and all that kind of thing was these, uh, what they called cable access channels. It was channels that were set aside on a local cable system for local production and local programming. And uh, I produced a cable television program about witchcraft back then. It was called Kestrel and Company. It, they gave me a contract for six episodes, best I could get. And a little story went out in the Associated Press. Somebody leaked a story from the station out in the Associated Press. The next thing you know, I get a phone call from the studio and said, uh, Cheryl, uh, you know, there's a little 300-word story went out in the Associated Press today. This was May 23rd, 1991. See, numbers. And uh, I says, well, did we get some press ink? And the guy says, uh, no, Cheryl. CBS and ABC News are sitting in the lobby, and they want to talk to your witches. And uh, we ended up doing uh, – we ended up getting additional contracts to produce because of this visibility. Uh, Larry King had us on uh, Entertainment Tonight, came to our studio while we were taping a show. Uh, we did uh, 90 interviews in the period of the next 18 months, and we got to produce some 70 episodes of the program at that time. It was the first regularly scheduled program about witchcraft by witches. My goodness. And a little bit earlier, you mentioned about being in the service, uh -huh. did any of your team members ever tell you strange stories of their experiences to you? Uh, not in the Air Force. Uh, not in the Air Force. Uh, the people I worked with were a very conservative bunch, um, but conservative or they were wild, okay? Uh, you know, m motorcycle people, that type of thing. And I, and, I, and I don't have anything against motorcycle people. It's just some of these guys had come back from overseas and they, uh, they let us say they had evolved over there. <laughs> and heck, I evolved over there. You know, I came back uh, quite a different person uh, my, my time in Asia. Uh, but um, how do we want to say this? Uh, it wasn't until I got in the Navy it wasn't until I got out two years worth of training and actually got on a nuclear submarine. Nuclear submarines go out and punch holes in the ocean for 60 to 100 days at a pop underwater. Okay, now if, I, I know there are people in the audience who are cringing at that thought. All oh, that water above me, you know, it's like sitting in a windowless office building. It's not that much different. Is if the floor moves now and then. But the bottom line was. Um, you had a lot of time. It was almost like a little monastery. It was, you, you had time to talk to people, smart people, really smart people, people who worked in nuclear engineering in the back. And all these electronics people I worked with were, were very smart people. And uh, we would talk about things, mystical topics. We talked about UFOs now and then, but nobody owned up. Very rarely did anybody own up the scene when I never shared my sighting with anybody till about 20 years ago. Okay. I mean, I kept it that close to myself for years. So I understand when, when I give you a number that says one in 250 people reports what they see, one in 250 people, um, 
you can appreciate why most people have had this stigma since the late 60s. Oh, you know, only kooks, nuts, and crackpots see these things. In fact, when we came out with some of our data in 2021, our 20-year sample, uh, I had the guy down at the, the local um, office printing store say to me, hey, Cheryl, did you take out the kooks, nuts, and crackpots? And that got into another whole conversation of how do we make this assessment of how much of the data is good? So what are your thoughts on why people see UFOs? You know, it's believed that some UFO craft have stealth technology, yet thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people see UFOs across the globe. While only a handful may be genuine, why do you think people are having sightings? Norio Hayakawa, a Japanese researcher, believes that maybe people are pre-selected to have experiences. What do you think? Okay, there's a topic that's up until about two years ago, wasn't talked about a lot about in the UFO community, and that was the idea of consciousness, okay? Okay, remember, I'm a mystic. Been a card-carrying witch for over 44 years. I spent seven years in a Buddhist monastery t t learning the mystical arts even better than what I already knew, okay? The deal is, a couple, of, a couple of my other mystical friends, we seem to think, well, I'll give you a lesson from one of my lamas. He said, hey, he said, people do not are not aware of a lot of the paranormal things going on around them on a day-to-day -day basis. He said, okay. He said, because they have a very narrow view of reality, okay? And in order to see some of this other really interesting stuff, you have to expand your view of reality, okay? Now, if you talk to Ray Hernandez, who was the chief, chief off, off, author of the book um, Beyond UFOs, they interviewed almost 4,000 experiencers, people who have been touched by E.T., and they all kept, came back two ways. They came back and they, uh, if they were a uh, hellfire and brimstone Bible thumper, they came back spiritual. If they were, uh, they were agnostic or atheist, they came back spiritual, okay? And one of the points he made to me is this, ET, everybody who gets touched by ET comes back deeply spiritual. He says, Are they trying to turn us all into mystics? Well, I can't argue with that. Because there's a lot of us who really believe, oh, there's hardware floating around out there that's not from this earth, not from our world, okay? But there's a lot of indication that say that some of the UFO presentations are of a metaphysical nature, okay? Um, and it's the only way I can explain it. So uh, if the UFOs have all this great stealth technology, and they do, our own stealth technology can take a big bomber in and on radar and make it look like the birds and the bees. That's how good the stealth technology is. Now, if we've got that, they do. Okay. So the bottom line is, is that people, if, if, if you see a UFO and you cannot explain it, it changes you. It changes your view of reality. It expands your view of reality a little bit. And at that point, maybe you're, you're connected to all that is a little bit more, okay? Every atom in our body, this is the monk talking, this is the Buddhist nun talking here, every element in our body is connected to every atom, everywhere, every when. We are part of all that is, okay? And the fact that we think we're alone, that we're one by, yeah, I'm just me by here, here in this little, well, it's, yeah, you're, it's you there in that little chicken suit, okay? The meat sock, as we call it, okay? But deep, that bit of consciousness, that part of you that talks to you behind this mask of flesh, here is your deeper consciousness, and your deeper consciousness is connected to everything. All the knowledge of the universe, all the wisdom, that's how remote viewers do it, because you're connected to a non-local source of information. Einstein did it this way. His thought experiments were kind of this type of 
deep meditation, doing mathematics and deep meditation. And by the way, information came in. Some of the best stuff I know about magical practice, you know, I got a lot of it out of the book when I was first studying it, but best stuff I know how to do, I got from someplace else. Okay. Once you learn to quiet the chatter of your Western mind, what we call monkey mind, and ta -ta 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 -ta, you're looking at your phone 80 times a day. You can't walk into a restaurant without 12 feeds of sports channels and things up there blaring at you, okay? You have to learn to quiet your consciousness. And once you can be a, quiet your consciousness and learn to be alone with your thoughts, then all this stuff opens up to you, okay? That's the best way I can put it. But some of these UFOs are hard manifestations, as they say, tin cans, and others are metaphysical manifestation. That doesn't mean they're, they're not real. Oh, they're real. But they're a different form of manifestation. My Buick sitting out there in the parking lot is one manifestation. It's nice hard matter. It's mostly plastic, you know, that type of thing. But it's a manifestation itself, okay? In magic, we use thought to generate form. Magical people turn thought into form, okay? And or the causes to generate form. So that's where this comes from. That's a little mini case of, of mystical thought in UFOs, but that's basically the idea that we are connected to everything. And a lot of this manifestation we're seeing, ET wants us to see them so that we grow our, our view of reality a little bit. I was lucky to be able to interview Ray Hernandez and he brought that up. But what if we're just being allowed to see these entities to open up our minds, to to change our perspective on how we see reality today? And I do see that as very valid. Uh, we have a few minutes left before we go into the next break. So my next question is doing this for decades, combing through data, collecting data and speaking with others. And for those that want to do the same, how are you able to discern fact from fiction or information from disinformation? What helps you filter the things you look at while conducting research? Okay, uh, real short answer on this. Um, remember I said the, the, the guy at the copy store was saying that you take out the kooks, nuts, and crackpots. And I would ask him, uh, how would I do that? And his view was, well, he knew something about UFOs. And he said, well, you know, you got to do all these case studies. I said, yes. And, you know, ever since our first book came out, I've had lots of hate mail. Oh, you don't do case studies. You're not a field investigator. There's more to doing case study and analysis than just being a field investigator. My hat's off to the field investigators. I'm a 70-year-old 70 70-year-old 70 lady. My spouse is a couple, three years behind me on that. We don't like cow patties, we don't like ticks, we don't like barbed wire, and we don't like stomping around in the mud in Mrs. Murphy's cow yard looking for UFO evidence, okay? So we took a different approach. Let's do one big case study. Let's look at the bulk of the numbers. Instead of looking at one sighting and analyzing it to death, looking at one ant through the microscope, we decided to study the ant hill. okay? So um, one of the things, I don't know how much time we got to go to break here, but um, one of the things we do, and even the MUFON investigators do something like this. I see Dr. Filet, Jacques Filet says, 80% uh, of the sightings are noise, junk. Uh, MUFON investigators will tell you about 70%. Uh, Cheryl and Linda came up with another different method, but we came up with another around 68, 69% ourselves. So we, let's just say 70% okay, is noise. We took 70% of the data right off the top. Said, okay, we don't, I don't know which one we took off that. We just said 70% of the numbers. 30% might be real. What does that tell us? Okay, and I don't know if you have to go to break right now, but when you when we come back from break, I can tell you what 30% of the numbers are. And there are some people who think that UFOs are far more rare. Oh, maybe only 1%. So we took 99% off the top. And it will blow the socks off when I tell you what the numbers are. Well, we're going to hear those numbers right after this break. <laughs>
million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse. KUNX DB. VX. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you are in the future because you're listening to Christina Gomez and Shifting the Paradigm. thank all of you for listening to the x but did you know you can watch live streaming video and catch your favorite video casts on the unx network youtube channel wow you mean i can watch the x shows anytime that's right watch any show anytime even binge watch your favorite programs which shows are on the unx network youtube channel you can watch most haunted with dan terry entity voices paranormal evidence paranormally blonde and unexplained phenomena all Australia, and many more. Also, be sure and catch live coverage of special events and special broadcasts from the UNX Network. That's great. I'm going to subscribe to the UNX Network channel right now. Awesome. You can find everything you need to know about the YouTube channel at unxnetwork.com. That's unxnetwork.com. It's your one-stop shop for everything unexplained. It's the new mainstream. It's the UNX Network. Explaining the unexplained. The new unxnetwork.com. Are you ready to read about true paranormal events? Unex Media publishes nonfiction books about UFOs, ghosts, and haunted places, time anomalies, cryptid creatures, and more. Just like KUNXDB Radio, it's all about unexplained phenomena. Visit www.unxmedia.com to see our list of great book titles by Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Gene Walker, Devin Listrom, Wayne Lawrence, Bill Spicer, and yours truly, Margie K. That's unxmedia.com. Gold loves chaos, uncertainty, and disarray. History shows us what gold does when people aren't sure, aren't sure about the government, the stock market, their jobs, or their retirement savings. Our national debt is skyrocketing. Gold and other precious metals are a defense measure against inflation and a stock market that might take years to recover. So what can you do right now to protect yourself? Call United Gold Group. We offer gold and other precious metals delivered securely within 72 hours. Are you worried about the stock market? We can also help you set up a real gold or silver IRA or a 401k. Safe and secure. United Gold Group makes gold ownership affordable. Call now and get up to $2,500 in free gold or silver with a qualified IRA. Call 800 753 8534. That's 800 753 8534. Or visit unitedgoldgroup.com. What are those numbers? Okay, if we take 70% off the top, 167,632 leaves us with about 50,000. Okay, of that 50,000, 
there'd be an average of about, okay, well, first, uh, let's, let's look at the bigger number for a moment. It would be something on the, okay, that's 167,632 would be about 8,300 per year, about 700 per month, about 161 per week, and about 23 per day on average. Okay, and I use that word average loosely. And then, okay, we take those numbers off and we look at a number like um, uh, the 30%, keeping 30% of the sightings. That would give us a number of about 2,500 a year, about 210 a month. Now, here's the goofy thing about that 210 a month. 210 a month for the 240 months of 20 years, okay? Now, if all states were equal, they're not, but if all 50 states were equal and you put it into 210 a month, that would be four sightings every month for 240 months by all 50 states. Four sightings a month for 20 years every month in all 50 states. If all states were equal, they are not. But that gives you an idea. There's a lot of them out there. Now, people come back to me and say, but, 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 but Cheryl, they got to be more rare. Oh, newspaper editors and news directors, TV and radio stations. They're the ones like, oh, no, Cheryl, they can't get here from there. You know, the physics, oh, it's, 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 be reasonable. The science says they can't get here from another star system, let alone another galaxy. Okay, fine. I said, how about we take 99% of the sightings away? Keep 1%. Let's assume that 1% are real off-world craft coming here and visiting us, okay? Let's assume that for a moment. I got the number here in front of me. Okay, 1% of 167,632 would be 1,674 for that whole 20 years. And it doesn't really make any sense to go down to the yearly amount or the monthly amount. But what it does come down to is of the 240 months of the 20 years, 2001 to 2020, we would average seven UFO sightings. Let me verify that here. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's exactly what it was. Um, we would, it would give us seven off-world craft per month in the United States every month for the last 20 years. I know the United States is a big place, and I know we probably have more of that really than seven, but in a worst case situation, 1% being the real thing by some people's standards, that would be somewhere in the United States every month for the last 20, 20 years, uh, there were seven off-world craft from someplace other than this world or this dimension showing up. That still mind boggles me, you know, and uh, and like I said, only one in 254 people report them. Uh, let's see, in the bigger number, 167,632. Love that number, just rolls off my tongue. You know, you go to the hairstylist and you rattle that number off, and she goes home and tells all her family, rattles everybody. Um, it, there are 3,135 counties in the United States. 3,100, 3,100, uh, 3,135, 3,150. Depends on if certain cities become counties into themselves in some cases. Virginia Beach is like that. The whole county is one, technically one county city. Los Angeles County is like that as well. All right. If you look at these numbers, uh, 3,135 counties only... 3,030 counties had UFO sightings. Wait a minute, that's most of, the, most of the counties, right? Let's say this way, 105 counties in the United States did not have sightings and 3,030 did. That's a pretty wild number. Let's take it a step further. Uh, we added zip code data to our database back in 2020, just before we started producing the 2021 book. There are... 4,000, I'm sorry, there are 41,692 zip codes in the United States and 18,605 
reported UFO sightings. Okay, now you look at it, any particular state, and the map kind of has a checkerboard square quality. It's not squares, but it's it's a patchy work type of thing all over the map. You look at all the zip codes. And this told us an awful lot about the setting. See, if you look at it at a county level, it seems like, oh, that county had a big city in it. That's why. And we found out that the the drivers for UFOs, uh, let me give it to you this way. I've got a hand, I got it in the crib notes here. I don't remember everything off the top of my head. Okay. We identified and this is what a lot of people just assume, okay, there's a big city. There's lots of sightings. It's population, Cheryl. You know, that's what they told me. Okay. We determined that in our first book that it was population, temperate weather was a driver, leisure time was a driver, hours of darkness was a driver, and observer access to broadband was a driver. There are places where there's lacking of rural broadband. And guess what? Some of those are those count 105 counties. I told you don't have UFO sightings. Or if you go around the Great Lakes, the thousand the sightings are in the many thousands on the states that touch the Great Lakes. Move two states away and the numbers fall into the low hundreds. And you find out that those are rural states and they have very are lack very seriously in rural broadband. Now the other thing we determined. We determined that there were things called influencers. The drivers touch every state, but the influencers only touch certain ones, like a proximity to large body of water. So that's why a state like Florida that has 1,200 miles of coastline and half the population of Texas has almost uh, has probably 30 percent more sightings than Texas does, which has twice the population of Florida. Texas only has about 450 miles of coastline. Okay. Uh, proximate, my, my colleague, Tom Conwell, who's a paranormal investigator, took our first book and started plotting uh, on a wall, a huge map, looking for certain things. He found out that a proximity to toxic ecosystems, dead gas fields, dead oil fields, uh, brown fields, pollution fields, polluted, heavily polluted lakes, heavily polluted rivers, uh, dead coal mines, strip mines, okay, coal mine fires. There's some 40 or 45 coal mine fires in, this, in the United States have been going on for upwards of 70 years in some cases. Okay. Proximity to geological fault lines and high visibility media reports. What does that mean? That means if a bunch of people report a UFO today, there's a whole rash of UFO reports over the next couple of days. Particularly, like say in a particular town, had a newspaper article about it and suddenly there's a whole bunch of... And, Project Blue Book tried to say, well, that's copycat reporting. We found out that it is retro reporting. Pe people said, wow, they had all those sightings yesterday. Maybe I should report what I know. And that one I had two months ago or two years ago. So you go back to the National UFO Center, Reporting Center and you see a spike day with lots of reportings. And you go back to that particular state that had a whole bunch of reportings. And you look and you'll see over the next couple of days, you'll see more retro reports from that same state because people now think, well, maybe I should report it. And two, oh, I can report it to the National UFO Reporting Center. Okay, who knew? And then there's this thing called the generational effect. The two most populous counties for UFOs, I shouldn't say populous, the two most prominent counties in the United States for UFOs are Los Angeles County, California, in Maricopa County, Arizona. Maricopa is where Phoenix is, and obviously LA County is where LA City is. Now, I said this, the county, not the city. Los Angeles County has more sightings, than something like 38,000, 3,800, something like that over 20 years. And that is more than 38 individual states, that county by itself. Maricopa County, Arizona has more sightings than 36 individual states. Now we said, why? Now we have a theory. People in Los Angeles County, grandpa told us about the Battle of A back in February 1942. Maybe if I look up, I'll see something. You go to Arizona. Mom and dad saw the Phoenix Lights back in 97. Maybe if I look up, I'll see something. That's the generational effect. And we've talked to a lot of people and we seem to think that might be the driver or the influencer. How many of those high-level sighting locations have military bases nearby? 
Okay, that one, okay, people ask that question all the time. Um, military base, and, and uh, Lou Alessandro, the guy that left the Pentagon and knows about UFOs, I interviewed him three times as a reporter. Okay, first thing he said is they really only haunt the high technology. Code word, high technology, nuclear weapons. So the fleets have them, certain active duty bases. Now, back in the 70s, there was somebody who used National UFO Reporting Center data and clustered it around military sites. Well, after the end of the Cold War in the early 90s, most of those bases got down, either closed or downgraded to Air National Guard, Army National Guard, uh, or, uh, Air Force, Army, Navy, Reserve bases, that type of thing. Okay, so um, they didn't have this advanced technology. So yeah, if you want to try and correlate it to military bases, yeah, you'll hear some of the senators in Washington right now with the UFO report saying, hey, they're over our bases. Well, they're over the active duty bases with high technology. Okay, your average Joe Bull base out here that really hasn't had a lot going on except for reservists flying there on the weekends doesn't have any or has very few. The same thing goes for people always ask me, what about the nuclear power plants? There are 55 nuclear active nuclear power plants in the United States. I have the street address and county of every one of them, right down to the zip code. The numbers don't correlate. They don't seem to haunt them. Now, back in the 70s, there was a lot of activity around the Indian Point reactor uh, in the Hudson Valley. It was known to be a, a leaky reactor, but that's not the case anymore, okay? Most of the nuclear power plants are not haunted by the UFOs. They are interested in this technology and they're interested in our waste, nuclear waste, and they're interested in all of our other waste. In fact, the ETs, the, uh, the people who have touched ET come back and tell guys like Ray Hernandez, they told us to take care of our planet, okay? So uh, they're not around the things you expect them to be around. They really aren't. Thank you for making that clear. You also researched the different shapes of the craft. Can you tell us about these different shapes and the possible differences in speed or location or anything that tells them apart other than their shape? Um, okay, the shapes. And you're catching me off guard here for a second. Um, there's about between both databases. Sometimes they call the two databases will call something different. Uh, a chevron might also be called a boomerang, okay, in another database, okay. So you have to kind of be kind of careful there. But the most prominent uh, sighting out there, other than a light in the sky, okay, undefinable light in the sky, the most popular sighting after that is a circle of lights, okay. That's very common, it's very heavy. Uh, over the 20 years, um, uh, we're talking almost 15, 20, about 20, almost 20,000, I believe, off the top of my head, okay? Um, then you get into the spheres. Uh, last year, year before last, they came out with that picture from the USO, USS Omaha from 2019, one of those infrared pictures you saw. In the picture, you could see this sphere-shaped thing uh, hovering over the water. And I had a reporter from the West Coast called me. He says, hey, a sphere's a thing? And I said, yeah, 17,115 in the last 20 years, you know, that type of thing. So, yeah, there's some serious shapes out there. Um, let's see, circle of lights, triangles, spheres, uh, flying saucers, still pretty, even though that's what I'm going to call your, da your granddad's UFO, there's still a lot of them seen. Um, some of these weird exotic ones, squares and rectangles, been seeing a lot more of them the last few years. Uh, dumbbells, tic tacs, that type of thing, still very low on the sightings. Cone shapes, very low on the sightings, uh, handfuls. But there was one thing uh, in 2013, 14 going down, uh, going down. UFO sightings had, had reached a peak, and they were going down by 30% a year. Now I was still running my newspaper column at the time and I was writing stories about it. Hey, how come they fell off 30% this year and they threw off another 30% the next year? And they, they tanked in 2017, okay? And I was at the 2017 MUFON Symposium in Cherry, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. My spouse, Linda, and I had a, took a computer laptop with us and took a little printer with us. And if you told us what state and county and, uh, and 
you were from, we'd give you a printout of the data for your county. Okay. And uh, Lou Alessandro and I were talking about the fact, the state of the fact that the UFO sightings had really tanked. They were down 70%. And of course, I got mail from everybody. Oh, Cheryl, Ford, Space Force chased them away, or they ran out of money, or they're sick of talking to us, da 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 da, da or there's going to be a big disaster, you know, whatever. And I kept telling everybody, it's part of a natural six to seven year cycle. Okay. If you look at uh, um, 40 years worth of it, it looks like a little snake going across the grass, up and down, up and down, up and down, over a period of six to seven years. This, this little humpy thing. Okay, they come up and they go down. They come up, they go down. Okay, but this looked like that, and I told everybody this: this is a natural cycle. They'll be back in 2019, 2020 time frame. I took 2019 off to work on other projects. The paper went out of business, so I just went work on other projects for then because I knew the numbers would be coming back. And then um, February of 2020, just before we went into lockdown, I got a call from George Knapp. Uh, out of KLAS out in uh, uh, Vegas. And he said, hey, sure, my phone's ringing off the hook. There's sightings, lots of sightings. Everybody's seeing sightings. And I said, okay, I didn't know because I hadn't been paying attention. So I had, by this time, I had had, I had built a mathematical model. New Forks data was about 60% of the data and New, uh, uh, new Proof Funds data was about 40% of the data. And I had a model. And I plugged two months worth of data in and project it out. And I called George back about an hour later and said, George, this is looking like it's going to be the best year since 2012. It was going to be a banner year. And 2020 was a banner year. Okay. So that, that's the deal. Uh, some stuff, some of this aspect is predictable. Now, I do have television producers come to me all the time. Cheryl, we want to go to the hot spot. We want to go to that place that, that like they show up like, every day type of thing. We want to be able to be there with the camera waiting for them. And I had a hard time trying to explain to him, I don't think this kind of a thing exists, that they show up that often. All right. That said, 2017, I'm talking to Lou Alessandro at that MUFON convention. They said, oh, by the way, I know everything's tanking right now. He said, but do you know that there's three shapes that are on the increase? And he looked at me and he said, huh? And I said, yeah, when this one shape shows up, these other two show up and they seem to function the same frequency, you know, as if one's the mother ship and the other ones are utility ships. He said, show me. And I printed it out for him. He looked at the graph. Got He's usually got a very stoic face, you know, and this was like stoic went to troubled, you know, and he said, can I have this? I said, yeah, just look at this little pal pocket. So, um, the numbers can predict some things, but we can't predict where they're going to be. Now, people say, where's the hot spots? Okay, the hottest zip code in the country is 85001. That's downtown Phoenix. 85001 is the hottest zip code in the country. They had 1,374 in 20 years. But I know that sounds like a lot. It only averages out to about five or six a month. So if you're planning to go to a camping trip or rent a hotel room and sit there and watch for a four or five a month, you, you're going to go through a huge pile of cash trying to wait, wait for them to come if you're going to be in a hotel. Okay. Um, the next one was Vegas. The next one after that was Los Angeles County. Okay. Same kind of thing. And that, their numbers in Vegas and Los Angeles County were half what the one in Phoenix was. Now, remember, I'm talking about a zip code and not the whole county. Okay. So um, this predictability was an issue. Now, some research we did a couple of weeks ago. This is new stuff. Only one or two podcasts have gotten this information. I've identified, okay, 20 years, uh, okay, one, one shape for 20 years would be 7,303 days. Okay. That's how many days, including year, year, leap year days. Okay. If you take 50 states, times it by that, you end up with 146,060 days, okay? In that 146,060 days, we've identified 737 one-day hotspots, someplace where nothing ever is going on, rarely. Okay, I'll give you an example. April 16th, 2008, 
Indiana, state averages maybe two UFO sighting reports a week. That particular day, they had 25 in Indiana. And most of it was in um, two counties, neighboring counties. Okay? That's a one-day spike. Okay? So we've identified 737 spikes. Uh, we only developed the method to identify it and look at it in the past three weeks. Okay? This is still deep research we're doing. Okay, and we found these days, and uh, they're very interesting. Anything with more than four sightings, because the average day, any one particular location in the United States, nothing's going on. Maybe onesies, twosies, okay, a th rare threesies, and a statistically sig significant four or more. Okay, that's what was our criteria. It's amazing stuff. And uh, we're going to probably, in our next series of books, we're probably going to publish what the hotspots are, um, what these, in fact, I'm thinking about writing one separate little book about just these 737 hotspots, one-day hotspots. Do different shapes appear at specific locations? Uh, if you're analyzing shape statistics, not all shapes show up in all 50 states, okay? Even the ones that where there's certain shapes, there's like 12, 15, 17, 19,000 of them in 20 years. Uh, not every state has every shape. And there are some shapes that are very rare. They've only shown up in a half a dozen states, okay? Shapes have seasons. Didn't know that until we were producing the 2020 book, 2021 book. Yeah, we didn't know that until we got looking at the graphs and we started noticing that certain shapes had seasons. And so when people come to me and we're looking for a hot spot, they'd say, well, and where's the hot spot? I said, well, are you looking at it by population? Are you looking at it by a particular shape, a particular season? And he said, what do you mean? I said, UFOs have seasons, shape, different shapes. They're not all the same. Okay. Now, um, if people have, we have a hot spot day, talk, first thing, talk to a cop, 20 people saw an accident and you've got probably 20 different stories what they saw. Any cop will tell you that. If I look at a particular day they had, we'll say a spike of 12, 12 sightings. If I see that the majority of them were like, somebody said it's a circle light, somebody else said it was a sphere, somebody else said it was a, a saucer, you know, maybe on the side, you know, you know what I'm saying? Something that resembles circular, I'll say, yeah, that's a hot spot for something like that, a circle, a sphere, or something like this. Um, but when they tell me, oh, they saw squares there too, or they saw triangles there, then it's a different thing. But there are some sightings that are a spike day where they saw a lot of, they saw a lot of formations, or they saw triangles, or they saw cubes. Or something like this, you know. So different things, they're not always consistent, but you can see patterns if you look real close at them and see, well, okay, majority of stuff reported that day had a circular look to it. Okay. That makes sense. That that does make more sense when you put it like that. Um, Cheryl, thank you so much for being on Shifting the Paradigm. This This time just flew by. Where can people find you online to stay up to date with your research? Actually, we took down our website. Uh, the um, hackers took it apart three times. Okay. And we just said enough, enough. Uh, trolls, anti-UFO trolls. Okay. But if you want our book, UFO Sightings Desk Reference, it's a big, bright pink book. You can find it on Amazon. You go up to the book search area on Amazon, uh, put in UFO, Costa, C-O-S-T-A, Boom. You'll see both our books. There's a white book and there's a pink book. The pink book's the one you want. There's another book there called The UFO Beat that is a collection of all of my articles. If you like the stories, that book has all 238 of my articles from the seven years I wrote the newspaper column. Thank you so much. You're listening to the UnX Network. KUNX DB, Kansas City, Missouri. I would like to thank Cheryl once again for coming on the show, sharing her perspective, her journey, and her knowledge with us. All of her social media links and books are in the description box below. 
Reminder, Mysteries with a History has been moved to 2 p.m. PST Wednesday instead of Thursday. The topic will be the mysterious Bridgewater Triangle. You do not want to miss this live show co-hosted with Jimmy Church of Fade to Black Radio. If you've never heard of this, you're in for a treat. If you have heard of this triangle, tune in as there will probably be some information that you've never heard of. The show has been moved due to my work schedule and summer college courses, but this change will not be permanent. We should be going back to the normal time slot the following Thursdays at 2.30 p.m. PST. I would like to mention that my show Strange Paradigms will be airing live every Friday at 3 p.m. PST where I cover paranormal and mysterious news items of the week. So make sure to ring the notification bell if you are watching this on YouTube. Also take a look at my website at strangeparadigms.com where you can catch all of the show archives, guest appearances, social media links such as Facebook, Instagram, Discord, TikTok and more. Follow me on Twitter at eyes underscore on the skies to catch my updates and news. I want to wish you all a wonderful week. Please like this video or podcast on your platform of choice and share it with those who have the same interest. Subscribe if you haven't already because there's a lot more great shows coming to you soon. Be safe and remember, keep your eyes on the skies.